Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and family, and everybody else, it's a great pleasure to be with you today on the latest edition of Real Talk with Billy and Corey, live from our homes in Zoom University. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Hot Take Billy Parvin, Tam on hand, joined by my podcast partner, Uncle Cornelius Michael. Some people call him Corey Van Dyke. Corey, it's great to be back with you for yet another one on this Zoom University podcast, and also after we reclaim the Commonwealth Cup. Yes, the, the cup is back in Blacksburg, where it belongs had a, a one year going away party, but now it's back and, and it was a nice feeling certainly to, to reclaim that and get it back to its rightful place. For sure. And as always, we have a special guest. It's been nice to re- revolve a couple of special guests uh, these last couple of podcasts, but our latest guest is none other than Virginia Tech alum Bailey Angle. He graduated uh, in 2017. He's currently the voice of the Bluefield College Rams. He also uh, does a bunch of games on the AC Network, so he's been uh, fully affiliated with the Hokies even since he left. It's hard to believe he was even a student because it it's feels like it's so recently that he's you know uh, you know he's still still at Tech. So Bailey, thanks so much for joining us, large time friend of mine. It's good to have you on the podcast. I think for the first time. So hey, yeah, thanks, man. I, I really appreciate uh, the introduction because um, the last time I talked to you, you acted like I was like, oh, you graduated like eight years ago. And I'm like, no, Billy, <laughs> I met you in college. I'm only two years older than you. So, uh, but anyway, uh, thanks for having me, fellas. For sure, Bailey Angle, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Virginia Tech, you might even go that far to say that. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> all right, guys, well, let's let's go to the big news. Uh, very exciting to see that the Commonwealth Cup is returning to Blacksburg after just a one-year absence. I think it was just a nightmare for the Cup or some woke up back in Blacksburg. But the Hokies defeat the Cavaliers 33-15. to uh, Both Corey and I predicted that the Hokies would win. I was way off, though. I thought it was going to be a defensive struggle. No one could move the ball 13-10, to but instead – uh, the Hokies score on every drive in the first half. Braxton Burmeister did a good job moving the ball. Virginia Tech, looking at Corey Van Dyke's article on techsideline.com, had a couple big plays from Khalil Herbert, a 76-yard run. Uh, Tavion Robinson had a 60-yard touchdown pass. Brian Johnson kicking 45-plus yard field goals like it was nothing. And uh, Hokies, they are able to uh, win the game and uh, secure the Commonwealth Cup once again. Corey, it felt like it was the Super Bowl of our season. Nice to get that win and what potentially could be the last game of the season. What are your thoughts on the win on Saturday night? Yeah, it really, you know, we, we had talked about that. It was like, if, if the Hokies can't get up for this one, then there's, there's even bigger and deeper issues that we need to dive into with this team and with the program. But sure enough, they did get up for it. They were, you know, I, I think we were all a little worried, uh, especially when, when James Mitchell, you know, muffed that punt and you were kind of thinking, oh, the wheels are about to come off. UVA is about to take it commandingly, but the defense steps right up for us, a field goal that they miss, and then they really dominated from that point on, um, scored 24 unanswered in the second quarter, and it really just looks like the better team throughout. And I mean, I think you look at it, and Khalil Herbert was obviously a big piece. When, when the Hokies were kind of rolling early on in the year, it was, you know, riding on the legs of Khalil Herbert, and that's exactly what they got going on, uh, going on Saturday night, 164 yards, had that big 76-yard touchdown. So to have him back and healthy and – and seeing him and Justin Fuente's first, uh, first, you know, a thousand yard rusher in his tenure at, at Virginia tech, that, that kind of says something about, you know, what Herbert meant to this team and all that he is. So I think, you know, great team victory, but I think you look at him and he was really kind of the, the, the spark of that started it for the Hokies and really kind of ignited it really early on. Bailey, you've been a Virginia Tech fan all your life. So first part of the question I wanted to ask you is, have you ever experienced a season like this in all your years of being a fan of the Hokies? And then I guess adding on to that, given that context, how sweet was it to get this win against Virginia, get the Commonwealth Cup back? Um, well, first of all, yeah, I, I guess I, I probably would say I've been more of a Virginia Tech fan, um, more so in college. Like I kind of like rooted for them when I was a kid. I was more of like a you know ride or die a Steelers fan um, and died last night, unfortunately, but uh, you know, I guess as far as a sweet victory, like, yeah, it was cool to beat Virginia. Um, but I, I did find myself almost frustrated at times because of how well they played. And I know that sounds crazy because, you know, why would you be frustrated at how good they played? But I'm thinking like, where has this team been in the games against Liberty, Wake Forest, you know? Uh, I mean, they were really clicking. The offensive line looked good. I mean, the defense was flying around everywhere. I think Devon Diablo – had probably his best game of his senior season. And I think that Virginia Tech's going to miss him. Um, it, it meant a lot. And, you know, I, I try to check myself on it, thinking it's the Super Bowl of the season because that kind of that kind of stinks if you're thinking of it like that when you end a five and six win over a team you beat 
20 out of the last 22 years. But yeah, it felt really good. And uh, like I said, man, it's a little, a little frustrating because you're like, wow, where have they been all year? Where was this potential that wasn't really hinged? And uh, Bailey, one thing I did want to add, one other stat is me and you in our four years of uh, undergrad were undefeated against uh, UVA. I'm like, Corey, uh, sorry to bring that up. But uh, Corey, the, the Hokies were, uh, were finished the season five and six. We, I don't think we know as of right now whether or not Virginia Tech will accept a bowl invitation. I think Justin Fuente was saying earlier that it, it's going to be up to his players. But if we don't have another bowl game, another game for the Hokies to play this season, how would you put this season into perspective? Yeah, but before I go into that, I, Bailey had a tweet that, that absolutely geeked me that I think kind of really he was talking about there, the feelings he, I'm going to read. He says, I equate this win to getting a complimentary dessert from the manager after lackluster service at Applebee's. It doesn't completely <laughs> take away the frustration of my appetizer sampler being cold, but I'm glad I got to share a brownie with my friends. I, I mean, I think that's just like a perfect description of an, exactly what he was talking about right there. So well done, sir. You gave me a laugh well, whenever you yeah. posted that. Well, thank you. I mean, I've been to a, I've been to plenty of Applebee's where that's usually happened to me. Uh, most mostly the one I, in my town that I live in now in Bluefield. Uh, but yeah, man, that's what it felt like. It really did. Like you know, you just sitting there and you're like, wow, most of this was not great, but at least at the end we had a little bit of fun. I mean, that's just as simple as the way to put it. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, going back to your your, your question, Billy. I mean, I think. I think it's looking likely that the Hokies will actually play in a bowl game. I've seen a lot of projections for them in the uh, the military bowl in Annapolis where uh, Hokies fans are very, very familiar with that bowl, and obviously there will be no fans this year. But uh, it's looking like that's a possible destination. Even after the game, all the players really sounded like they wanted to play in a bowl. It's not like uh, UVA or, or Boston College and Pitt who have kind of come out and say we don't even want to play in a bowl game. A lot of these guys sounded like they wanted one more chance to play together as brothers. But, I mean, you look at it, I think – it's, it's hard to, to take this season and, and feel good about it just because of a UVA win. I mean, I think there's a whole lot of, of disappointment, frustrations that you look back on and you think, man, what could have been if, if the team, you know, looked like they were playing last night, if that team showed up each and every week, what, what could this Hokie team have been? I, obviously, I don't think they, you know, go 10-1 and one or 9-2 and two or anything like that, but they certainly could have been an 8-3 and three ball club out there. So it, it's a, a lot of what ifs, I think, is, is kind of the – the ending legacy of this 2020 Hokies is a lot of what ifs and what could have been. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think going forward now we'll, we'll see, obviously I'm sure we'll dive into this, the, the future of Fuente and what that all brings going forward and recruiting and stuff like that. But I mean, I think it certainly is a whole lot sweeter to be building off of this as opposed to the, the toxic, you know, portion of the fan base and everything else that would have been going on had the Hokies lost to UV. It, it does certainly make it, a little bit sweeter going into the off season or, or into bowl season. Bailey, I have to ask you this question uh, point blank. Cause obviously there's been a lot of speculation surrounding the status of Justin Fuente's job. Are you in the fire Fuente camp? Uh, I, you know, I don't really think, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I can really take a position on this really, but uh, I think that I think we should kind of think about the financial situation of it. I mean, you know, it, it's kind of crazy to think of firing a guy and then having to pay him 10 million or whatever, however many million dollars. And people I know are getting laid off and pay cuts in the athletic department. So I, I guess I don't, I, I think it's like kind of a sticky situation to really just say fire him. Cause then, you know, for the people that are saying fire him, it's like, okay, then hire him with who and with what money. So you're going to get a guy on discount that maybe you don't want either that might not be qualified. The only person that we can afford. So I don't really think that firing a guy is going to solve any problems. If that kind of answers your question. All right. Well, how about this? Okay. We don't know if, you know, he's going to get fired until it officially happens, but if, you know, on last Saturday was his last game, how would you put into context this whole, uh, you know, Virginia tech tenure? I mean, it started out with a lot of promise. I think it was your senior year. Correct me if I'm wrong. They went to the AC championship game, had a good year after that nine wins. And really after that kind of uh, was not up to what we were used to in those first two years. How would you put Justin Fuente's tenure into perspective if Saturday was his last game? Uh, I mean, you know, there's a good amount of like genuine frustration, which I find is, you know, it's a bit disappointing, but I mean, there's some good moments in there too. I mean, you look at my senior year, which was obviously his first season, but they're one or two wins away from, uh, or one or two drives away from being a, you know, just a really good team. You take a few losses away from that year and mistakes. Uh, Syrac uh, Syracuse, which was the worst one. 
Georgia Tech, uh, Tennessee. I mean, we had a, I think we, there was a 14 nothing lead Virginia Tech had against Tennessee. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of tough to, to label it really. Um, and I think that a, a lot of Fuente critics kind of don't remember those last couple years of the Frank Beamer tenure either not being that spectacular because they're like, oh, we just want to get back to that. Or really, you know, 2015, Tech went six and six. And then they went six and six the year before that too. Um, and then I guess it was 2013, you kind of collapsed at the end of the year with a loss to Maryland and a loss to Duke too. So I, I think that what's been happening isn't necessarily the head coach's fault. It was just kind of like a downward uh, un, unfortunate trajectory that began a little bit before Fuente got here. And unfortunately it hasn't really improved with him either. Yeah, Corey, we always joke about how your brother Kyle came into Virginia Tech right about the time when the Hokies were done winning AC championship games and started to become more mediocre uh, as they currently stand right now. But you've obviously covered uh, Virginia Tech uh, and Justin Fuente's tenure with Tech sideline. How would you put into perspective how his years at Virginia Tech have been, again, if Saturday was, in fact, his last game? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely an interesting legacy where there is, you know, we talk about a lot of, a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Um, with it and coming in and, you know, winning ACC coach of the year, his first year and leading that team uh, to the ACC championship and, you know, coming kind of like what Baylor was saying, a drive away from, from even beating Clemson or tying that game against Clemson and uh, a chance to, to shock the world really there. And then, I mean, there's, so there's that part of the legacy and there's also the parts where, you know, he does kind of have these mind numbing losses that, you're thinking like you can't lose that game you can't lose to ODU you can't lose you know to Liberty like that you can't just lose you know to to Syracuse even in the in the, the year that they do have all that success so I mean it, it certainly is an up and down legacy and I mean I think he did uh he does kind of get a bad rap sometimes of just how he you know deals with the fan base and, and with the media and stuff like that I, I think he's just naturally a guy that he's not all about that. He's a guy that loves being around his players and being around them and pumping them up, but he doesn't really maybe put on that, that same emotion and that same kind of openness with, with those around. He's a, a guy that's very, keeps everything very close to the vest. So I don't know. It's, it's really hard for, for me to gauge where it is. And it, it kind of leaves that question too. Like you always hear that question with, with a coach that leaves or a coach that gets fired. Like, did he leave it better than, than when he got it? And, it really is a hard question to answer that with Fuente because really Beamer's years, like, like Bailey was saying, they weren't, you know, they weren't great by any stretch of the imagination getting the, these games at the end to, to have to win the last two games or whatever to get a bowl game. And they did that. That's pretty much what Fuente did in 2018 as well. So it, it really is a, a mixed bag kind of stuff. And I think personally that you look at, at, at Fuente and, and what he's done. And I mean, I, I kind of lean, I, we've talked about this on the podcast. I kind of lean uh, towards someone else taking over for him, but I certainly wouldn't be upset um, if they do decide to stick with him and, and see kind of where they go. I think there's obviously bigger bigger things in the program as well that, that need to be addressed than, than just Justin Fuente and what's going on there. So that's kind of where I stand on it all. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought that, and this was something that was really talked about when he first came in, I thought he was the perfect personality to – succeed Frank Beamer you know it's hard to succeed a legend and I think that he was very gracious towards Beamer uh, you know installing that you know who, someone wearing number 25 every game so I thought he was the perfect personality to, to replace a legend in Frank Beamer and I also think guys you know he went four and one against UVA now I know we obviously beat him what 20 out of the last 22 years as Bailey was saying but if you take that context out of the equation if you were to say any coach is going four and one against you know the arch rivals and you know the most important regular season game according to many fans I think that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good record to put put in it. And, you know, in the last five years, Bailey, I wanted to ask you this question. It's been alluded to before. It's something I asked Brady Hess last week. And, you know, it's the question of, do we have recency bias when it comes to Justin Fuente? And you look at the last couple of years of Frank, as you mentioned, I mean, I think about my senior, my freshman year, rather, which was the last year of Frank Beamer, you know, the Hokies had a couple of terrible losses to ECU. We all remember that loss to Pitt in the pouring rain when they only gained like hundred yards of offense with Brendan Motley at quarterback. Then you fast forward to my senior year under Justin Fuente, we lose to ODU, which is a terrible loss. We barely had to beat UVA, and I think in a lot of ways UVA gave us that game. And then we had to schedule Marshall to make a bowl game. I mean, do you think there are 
uh, recency bias when it comes to comparing Fuente and comparing Beamer? And what are the bigger problems you think that speaks to in the program? Uh, I, I guess what, what do you mean by like recency bias? Like, yeah, like just, people think it's yeah. so bad now under Fuente, but I'm saying if you look at the last couple of years of Frank, I don't think it's really that much worse oh. off than we were in the last few years of Frank. Yeah. Um, you know, I will say this for the, for the fans that are pretty, um, frustrated, which, you know, they, they've had reasonable reasons to be like that. Uh, I guess with those last couple of years of Frank too, um, which were obviously pretty tough, but it didn't really seem like those games were blowouts. Um, I mean, you got, you can fact check me on this, but I don't really remember getting blown out of the water except for on Thursday night against Miami where Duke Johnson had like 876 yards in one game. Um, but, you know, it's like, it, it's tough to watch some of these games that happen at home, like the Duke game last year, the Clemson game, which albeit, I mean, they're, they're a generational team. It looks like with Trevor Lawrence, uh, so, I mean, I kind of, I guess I kind of get the, the sentiment of being pretty frustrated with Fuente as far as losing these games by a lot, but, you know, I think that, yeah, they should kind of remember like six and we, the Virginia tech went seven and six for two straight years. And although, you know, this might be a losing season if they don't choose to go to the bowl and win the bowl. Uh, yeah, it, I think that, like I said before, it's, it hasn't been good for a while, and it's not necessarily Fuente's fault. Now, he does deserve some of the criticism that he gets. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's all his fault that maybe this, is, this program isn't where a lot of fans want it to be. And, Corey, you know, this is something I think we've alluded to in previous podcasts, but how disappointing do you think it is that Fuente really didn't have, like, a quarterback that he developed in his time at Virginia Tech? I mean, we think to really his first year, Gerard Evans was probably the best quarterback he had under his tenure Josh Jackson was not bad in that first year, nine and three, but he had some issues. He ended up transferring Quincy Patterson, at least according to some articles was hyped up as this really good prospect. He never really ended up panning out, you know, Braxton Burmeister, Ryan Willis, you know, some of these other guys, it didn't really look like he had a really good quarterback that he developed. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think personally, that's, that's the part that, that sits with me that was, you know, his, his biggest failing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, at Virginia Tech is he, he was built up as this guy the the quarterback whisperer the guy that you know was the OC under with Andy Dalton the guy that was made Paxton Lynch the the guy who he became in college and stuff like that and then you know he had the great year of Gerard uh, Gerard Evans it looked like okay the next guy's just going to step in and do that and Josh Jackson was up and down he ends up transferring um, Ryan Willis takes over he then takes a step back in his next year Quincy Patterson never really developed into a guy. Um, Hendon Hooker really, they, they use so much misdirection and, and smoke and mirrors type offense that they never even can, can use him as a drop back quarterback and stuff like that. So I think, you know, you look at him and maybe it doesn't all fall on Fuente either. A lot of it probably falls on, you know, Cornelson as well as the quarterbacks coach in OC where, you know, you look at all the top teams in college football today. You look at even all the, the four teams that are going to be in the playoff. That's, that's not to say the Hokies are, our team that should compete in the playoffs. But if you're going to be a top team in college football today, you have to have a quarterback that, that is a game changer on the field. Honestly, that is your, your go-to weapon. And the Virginia tech just has never had that really. You could say Gerard Evans was that, but like since him, they really haven't had anyone that would even you know qualify for that. So I think that's the part with me that kind of stands out the most is he was built up as this guy that can develop quarterbacks, can develop a, an offense where, you know, Bud Foster wouldn't have to carry the load anymore and stuff like that, but it, it really just never rang true. So I think, you know, me looking at it, that's certainly reason enough um, for, you know, the people that are out there saying he, he needs to let be let go or, or stuff like that. And Bailey, do you think Virginia Tech fans have unreasonable expectations for the team? I mean, if you think about it, look, even if we have a quote unquote good coach, we're not beating Clemson. We're not beating any of these, you know, big time college football programs, you know, and even, I mean, some of these games, like, you know, we talk about like, you know, how we got blown out against Notre Dame or Clemson. I mean, those are, you know, among the top programs in the country. And, you know, people forget under Frank Beamer, you know, might be disrespectful to say this. We only got close to the national championship one time and, you know, he's almost 30 years of coaching. I mean, do you think that at the end of the day, we have re unreasonable expectations as a fan base? Well, to be fair, they got closer a few more times. Uh, they, they just went to the national championship once. 
Uh, but I mean, a few other times you look at Boston College and whatever, 2008, 2007, whenever that crazy Matt Ryan play happened. Uh, I mean, they were pretty close that year as well. Um, but I, I think that it's not even just Virginia Tech fans. I mean, look, it's just how sports fans are. They're pretty unreasonable um, and pretty unrealistic. You know, like every year I think that the Steelers are going to win the Super Bowl. Or, you know, I mean, I thought that it could happen this year. It might not, as we've seen these past two games. But look, I, I mean, that, I think that you can't really put it all off on the fans, but you have to really – you have to take a step back sometimes and, like, take off your – maroon sweatshirt and be like all right maybe this isn't the year that tech gives it to clemson or this is the year that you know we get a big win in south bend so i i think that it, maybe it's just not just a problem in blacksburg as a whole but yeah i mean i would say at least some not all but some fans just have to take a step back and look and be like look at our their reasonable expectations of the year but Billy, don't you think, I mean, because look, we are, you know, I think a pretty respected program still. I mean, we've got a lot of history here. You know, we, in the past, at least, and maybe not so recently, have been able to recruit pretty well in the state. I mean, don't you think, you know, is it unreasonable to think, you know, okay, it's, you know, some of these seasons, we should be able to at least be competing for an AC championship game, maybe not against Clemson, but, you know, being able to potentially win the ACC or, you know, uh, being able to maybe not lose to some of these bad teams. I mean, it really does feel like to some extent that, you know, with the Hokies, there does seem to be some reoccurring themes that have happened, I think, in recent history. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, I would love for them. Obviously, I think they've had good chances to win the ACC Coastal in the past couple of years and get to the championship to try to beat Clemson and before that to try to beat Florida State. Um, but, yeah, they're right. These, these frustrating losses just kind of sneak up on you with Georgia Tech, uh, you know, before last year, obviously, where they were able to beat Puente, I guess, the first three times. And I mean, North Carolina is getting a lot better. So, I mean, there's just a, an unfortunate time of just the shift. I mean, I think North Carolina is going to be good for years to come. I mean, Mac Brown, I don't know what happened. I, I guess, like you talk about a recency, it's kind of hard to forget about the, like the last couple of years at Texas where he kind of got chased out of town, but they got him, they got a real, really good coach in North Carolina and they're just going to get better. So I think it's going to be tough and people can't, you talk about your previous question, like just being like uh, unrealistic, your re expectations. I remember, you know, losing in North Carolina, people are upset about that, which they have every right to be upset because the team lost, but you can't just expect they're going to roll over uh, them because Cam Chancellor did it and Xavier Adibi did it and Marcus Vick and Tyrod Taylor did it. It's just times are different now and people have up like updated and gotten better and just the ACC looks different. Corey, uh, are you still on the Tony Elliott train if the Hokies decide to move on from Puente? Is there maybe another coaching candidate that's really, I think, uh, made, you, made you more interested in potentially Hokies hiring them? No, I mean, I think, you know, if if it does end up, I mean, I'm sure we'll be here and here in the next even day or so if it does end up becoming official that, you know, the Hokies are letting go of Puente because that buyout starts or it goes down two and a half million tomorrow is, is kind of the cutoff for that. So, I mean, I think... Tony Elliott is, is the number one guy that jumps to mind. But I, I'm also just thinking, too, like, you know, Bailey mentions um, Mac Brown there, and that's a guy who, I mean, I don't think a lot of people had had even pegged him as, you know, a candidate even initially. Um, but you see even the the style that, that he runs. He, he's really the I, – I, I've talked about this on a previous podcast where he's, you know, the CEO head coach where he hires fantastic, you know, fantastic uh, – assistance around him. Phil Longo is one of the best offensive coordinators, you know, in, in football right now, you have uh, Dre Bly, who was a fantastic corner in the NFL for many years. And he's uh, one of their cornerbacks coach and stuff like that. So he, he surrounded himself of all these coordinators that are really, you know, there to do the work, whereas he's the CEO kind of directing all of them and being the figurehead and stuff like that. So it, I don't know who that guy could be, but it would also be interested to see if, you know, Virginia Tech goes for for that kind of hire as well and, and surrounding him with, with quality assistance. So that, that's kind of another direction I was even just thinking about it as Bailey was giving that response. Bailey, of course, if you, if you think there are any coaching candidates you might be interested in the Hokies taking a look at, feel free to share that, but also I want to get your take on Shane Beamer. I mean, here's a guy that I think, again, a lot of Hokies fans because of his name, because of his connection to the university, were pretty upset that he went to South Carolina. But what were your thoughts on South Carolina hiring him? And uh, should Virginia Tech be disappointed that, you know, we didn't go after him? 
I think it's a pretty uh, interesting hire. Obviously, I think Shane has a lot of charisma. Um, and I met him one time. Quick aside on Shane, and it meant a lot to me um, when this happened. Uh, my freshman year of college at Virginia Tech, unfortunately, uh, f- one of my high school football teammates uh, tragically passed away in practice, and he was a sophomore. Um, and Shane tweeted about it. He was the only person at Virginia Tech and only one of the coaches I had seen actually tweet about it and said, you know, our thoughts are with the New Kent community. So that actually went a long way with me. And, and I met Shane once and said that to him. I was like, however met, how much it meant to me. So personally, I, I thought that was really cool of him. Um, I think he's a charismatic hire. I mean, obviously he was there uh, in the good Spurrier years where they had um, Marcus Lattimore as his, as his running back that was a really – great running back that had some pretty devastating injuries. Uh, But, you know, as far as Virginia Tech passing up or not pursuing him, uh, I think it's, it's slightly disappointing, but you also also look at it kind of, I mean, maybe South Carolina is taking a semi risk that he hasn't been a coordinator, uh, but you still get that charisma there. You still get that name brand that you're bringing in players, which means a lot. And uh, I think uh, I saw Andrew Alex um, from ESPN, Blacksburg tweet this and I actually really agree with that take where he said something along the lines of if Virginia Tech hires Shane Beamer and then it goes wrong and they have to fire the son of the head coach that means everything to this community and this athletics department it would be the darkest day in the history of Virginia Tech so I I saw that and I was like huh that actually makes a lot of sense just like kind of rolling the dice on the family name and let's say it doesn't work out and then you have to let him go not only you know, the, the guy played football here, but his dad is a big part of the reason why, if not the only reason why Virginia Tech is a national brand. So I, I, I think that maybe it, it kind of stinks because it would have been pretty cool, but it makes a lot of sense to, to just for him to go to South Carolina. And I think that they got a good hire. Uh, and certainly the, I think the example that comes to mind for me, Corey, when I think about, you know, potentially going along with Shane Beamer's John Thompson, I mean, You know, his son got hired at Georgetown. A lot of people make the argument that, you know, he was only there for as long as he was being mediocre because he was the legend, Gary Coach's son. But uh, any last thoughts on the Virginia Tech program? I mean, obviously, we we may know in a day or two whether or not, you know, Fuente is still the coach here come 2021. But any last thoughts you wanted to share about Virginia Tech football, especially, again, if they don't play in a bowl game, it is the last uh, game on Saturday that they played this season. Yeah, I mean, I – I brought this up last time, and I think it is a good point to, to put out. You know, if if this is Fuentes, you know, that was his last game against UVA. Like, he went out on a high note, and he has kept this program, you know, squeaky clean in the process, and that's something that, that should be noted and should be said where not a lot of guys can can say that. A lot, not a lot of head coaches can say that in, in college football day with all the scandals and all the different allegations that go around nowadays. Like, Fuente has always – you know, done everything to the, the highest regard in that standard. Um, so he should be, you know, credited with that. And, you know, he, he's not a guy that, you know, Hokey fans should be, um, I don't know what the word, word is, should be look at and say like, man, I can't believe he was our head coach. Like that's, that's a disgrace that he was our head coach or anything like that. Like that, that's won't, no, no Hokey fan will ever say that. So I think, you know, you can look at that and say he has a good legacy from that standpoint, but I don't know. I think it is exciting to see uh, potentially where this can go because usually you get to the end of the season and that's kind of the end of the season. You're, you're gearing it up for the off season and stuff like that. And there's not a whole lot of storylines, but the storylines will, will continue to follow Virginia tech in these coming days. And uh, it will be nothing new, new in Blacksburg for, from that. And where it seems like the Hokies always seemingly have something going on. You can never just quietly. I think that they always joke with, uh, with Andy Bitter and stuff like that, as anytime he goes on vacation, he knows there's going to be a big breaking news story that comes out because that's just the the way Virginia Tech football is. He can never stay quiet for too long, and that certainly will be the case this offseason as well. Bailey, of course, if you have any you know last thoughts you want to share on the program before we transition, feel free to do so. But I did want to have – I have a hot take here about what the Hokies should do that I wanted to get your reaction to it. So, again, if the Hokies do decide to let go of Fuente, one name I want to throw out there is Bruce Arians. <laughs> Bruce Arians went to Virginia Tech. I believe he was Mike Burnham's roommate, but he's got his coaching career started at Virginia Tech. I mean, here's a guy that, look, I, like, I, think it, I don't think it's that uh, controversial to say if, if it doesn't work out with the Bucs this season, they're going to make a decision on either Bruce Arians or Tom Brady. You know, Bruce Arians is up there in age. I think maybe some NFL teams might be a little hesitant, hesitant to hire him. Why not bring him back home to Virginia Tech? I mean, 
give him the opportunity to be that CEO like Corey was mentioning and get some assistance around him. I mean, you know him following him as a Steeler fan. He was a very solid offensive coordinator there in Pittsburgh for a long time, a two-time NFL coach of the year. Why not bring back Bruce Arians back home and rebuild this Virginia Tech program? And maybe you can even start, you know, recruiting again on a nice note because, you know, a name brand like him would be a boost to this program. What are your thoughts on that? I I say to keep dreaming, man. I don't know if even that's a hot take. I just think that's unrealistic. I just don't know how that would happen. Um, also, he retired a couple of years ago and just kind of got enticed by being able to coach uh, Tom Brady, I believe, right? Or was he there? He was there last year too. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, I I guess that'd be a cool story. I think the college is a different game. I mean, you know, Lovey Smith took the Bears to the Super Bowl and he just got fired from uh from the Illini too so I I don't know man I I think that's I, I really appreciate your pie in the sky ideas Philly I really do uh but as far as is closing uh thoughts um you know as much as uh as much as maybe it's a hassle to play another football game and it's just going to be the military bowl if the kids want to play it the, if the football players want to play it let's play a game you know if, if especially now I'm just kind of getting sucked into the idea of like Oh, they, they played really well. Let's get that sixth win to go six and six to save it from a, a losing season. But, you know, I, I mean, I had a lot of fun watching them Saturday. So if they can play like that again for one more game and they think they can, they can win, so be it. I'd love to see them play again. All right. Well, we'll see what happens for Gene Tech. Right now finishes the regular season five and six. Got the Commonwealth Cup back. We'll see if, you know, they end up playing a bowl game and we'll see what the status is of Justin Fuente. We may find out the news in the next day or week or, you know, sometime soon. But let's transition to the NFL. Let's talk big picture. I mean, we're through, what, 12, 13 weeks of the season, fellas. It's picturing to be a very exciting season. First of all, props to the NFL. I mean, I definitely know when we started this season, I wasn't sure if we'd finish it. But even with a couple of hiccups along the way, Bailey knows about that as a Steelers fan, we've been able to get a few every game in here. And uh, it's been exciting to see. But, Corey, uh, big picture. We've seen some movement in the uh, NFL playoff picture. What have been your thoughts so far on this season? I mean, I think the the number one thing that stands out to me is just how dominant the, the Chiefs are looking now. They're the defending Super Bowl champions, and was was watching the game yesterday on on Red Zone against uh, the Dolphins. And you know, Tony Romo brought up the point they they look like an even better team than they looked last year. And I, I would certainly agree with that they're just running rough shot through the competition. They they kind of do seem to have this problem of letting off the brakes a little bit and letting teams back into it, like they kind of did with with the Dolphins in that game and the Bucks, uh, the game before. But, I mean, I think when when Patrick Mahomes wants to play and when he wants to, to really go out there and shine, no team has really, you know, had an answer for him so far yet, uh, other than the Raiders somehow that one game, which is still mind-boggling to me. But it, you look at it and you think, man, this, this team certainly seems poised to make uh, – a repeat run at the Super Bowl, which is extremely rare um, in a league where there is so much parity, where there is uh, kind of up and down teams all the time, uh, different winners and stuff like that. So I think that's kind of the number one thing that that's my takeaway from from this the past Sunday weeks of games and and kind of throughout the season. Bailey, you know, I got to ask you, you're a hardcore Steelers fan. I mean, what has happened the last two weeks? First of all, also a football team, which I never thought I would say this year. And then uh, I think last night is a little bit more excusable because I think the Bills are a team to reckon with in the AFC. But, uh, Bailey, what have been your thoughts on the Steelers' season overall? You might accuse me of hating a little bit, but honestly, yes. even when they were undefeated, I never really thought that they had a lot of impressive wins. I mean, they they swept the Ravens, but the Ravens have not been what they were the last couple of years. The Titans, you got to give them credit for that because they are win currently winning the AFC South. But what are your thoughts on, of course, the two-game slide, but what you've seen from the Steelers all season? Well, the first 11 games, I mean, I was pretty impressed because, you know, that's the Steelers that I, I've come to know and love that would lose games like that, that would lose to the Cowboys. Now, granted, those games were close. Um, and uh, the, beating the Ravens, that first game, I mean, the Ravens look like the regular Ravens to me. I mean, Lamar Jackson was still playing and carving up the Steelers a little bit. And also you have to kind of remember before that, that, you know, maybe not Lamar's not having an amazing season, but the couple of years before that, even when the Steelers were bad, uh, Lamar didn't play incredibly well against the Steelers anyway um, because that defense has been pretty tough. And, I mean, I think the last two games, unfortunately, just kind of seems like the chickens have come home to roost a little bit because the Steelers have had such uh, – they haven't played well. And 
somehow got to und- an undefeated schedule. Now they've had some good games. I mean, obviously, honestly, their best win of the year has been the Browns. I mean, they smoked the Browns. And Baker Mayfield threw a, a pick six like very early on into that game. Uh, the defense played very well, and the Browns have just gotten better. I mean, I didn't think that we'd have to say like the Browns is your banner win of the season, but they also did a really good job against Eric Henry. And I, I mean, last night, I think defensively in the first half, Josh Allen is legit and they held him pretty well. Now what the bills did, they adjusted and they made a lot of changes in the second half to where Josh Allen could succeed. They're like, Hey, how about we throw it to Stefan Diggs like every play. And that's what they did. Uh, but you know, as far as the Steelers, man, it, it kind of sucks to have a pit in your stomach when they're 11 and two. Uh, but you got the real heat of the season coming up with they got the Bengals next week, which is fine. But then you got the Colts and the Browns are two playoff teams right there. They're going to be playing for something. So, I mean, I think it's great. The Steelers are back in the playoffs, but you know, I was telling other people this when they were 11 and 0, I think they were 11 and 0 because of how well Ben Roethlisberger played because there's no way that they get to that clip with Mason Rudolph or Duck Hodges or really anybody. But now it just kind of seems like they're losing because of the off offense because of the drops and I mean Ben Roethlisberger can't throw it deep anymore which is fine I mean he's 37 38 years old uh don't really expect him to throw bombs but yeah man I I, I don't know I feel like it, it, it kind of sucks to be disappointed in in these past two weeks and just feel like oh the season's over because of injuries and then the Ravens made them play three games in the span of 12 days but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm being realistic now because it's like, oh, maybe they're better than the Chiefs. They just don't play as flashy of a, of a football style as the Chiefs do. But I, I think it's kind of hard to say that Kansas City isn't the best team by a, like a long shot in the AFC and it, pretty much the NFL right now. I, I wanted to ask you, because you, you mentioned the Bills, does Josh Allen remind you of a young Ben Roethlisberger? I mean, I've heard that comparison before, but I was curious from your perspective as a Steelers fan, whether or not you buy that comparison. Um, I mean... Obviously, it's it's pretty cool to see him succeed in what his second year is it his second year, uh, but I I don't know the first first couple of years have been I mean that first his rookie season where they he won every one of his starts except for the AFC Championship game, uh, it, they were a very much a running team so I think that Josh Allen uh, and Ben Roethlisberger and the offense has kind of morphed into a, an offense that more favors the quarterback situation but I think Josh Allen probably better than Ben Roethlisberger was those first two seasons. Cause you think like Ben Roethlisberger had Willie Parker and Jerome Bettis those first two seasons. Uh, and some of those running backs for the bills, it was kind of news to me that they were around. So I, I think Josh Allen's going to be around for a long time. He's very, very good. Moel D Moore is my favorite old Steeler to uh, <laughs> throw out there. <laughs> but um, I have to ask you, uh, Corey, uh, what, what do you think about the bills? First of all, I do want to say about the chiefs. This is a hot take for me, but, I think the only difference between Bill Belichick and Andy Reid is Tom Brady. If Andy Reid had any quarterback or if he had Patrick Mahomes for way earlier in his career, I think he'd have the same amount of rings as Bill Belichick. Because even if you look at his coaching tree, I mean, look at John Harbaugh, who coached under Andy Reid. He's won a Super Bowl. Ron Rivera, he's been a pretty successful head coach. He went to a Super Bowl. Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. You've got a couple of other guys who have been, I think, pretty successful. Sean McDermott is another guy. Matt Nagy had a pretty good year with the Bears a couple years ago. Whereas Belichick's assistants, Matt Patricia, Josh McDaniels, they haven't really panned out as head coach. So that's kind of my personal hot take. I think the only difference between Andy Reid and Bill Belichick is Tom Brady. But, uh, Corey, what do you think about the Bills? I mean, it seems like the last couple weeks they've really emerged as maybe the best alternative with the Steelers kind of having a two-game slide to uh, maybe potentially knock off the Chiefs. Do you buy that about the Bills? Do you still think it's the Steelers or maybe another team that we haven't mentioned? No, I mean, I, I think you look at the Bills, and they certainly have been impressive lately. And I certainly did like that second-half adjustment they did to throwing the ball to Diggs as a fantasy owner of Stephon Diggs. Um, but, I, I mean, I think that's the story of, of their team right now is you look at offensive coordinator Brian Dable, and he's really been a guy that has made just the right adjustments all year long. And, you know, they're a team, what, 9-3 nine and nine and three right now, I believe, maybe somewhere around there if not. And one of those losses is to the Hail Mary to – to D hop. So you take that away. They only have two losses potentially. And you, you're kind of naming them in the conversation as well of, of potentially fighting for a one seed, if not for that. So, I mean, I think you look at the bills and, you know, their, their defense is coming along as well, led by uh, our guy Tremaine Edmonds in the middle there and different things like that. So you look at 
what what McDermott is building in Buffalo and what they've kind of you know become over these last several years. They are certainly going to be a a team we'll, we'll keep our eye on and a team I think that'll be you know as long as Josh Allen is in there and they continue to surround him with weapons like they've had this year with Diggs coming in and, and Cole Beasley is you know returning to to his Cowboys form and stuff like that where he's certainly become one of the top slot receivers in the NFL right now you, you look at all of that and they have the the chops right now to compete I, I'm not going to put them on uh, you know, the Chiefs level by by any means right now, but I, I think they're certainly up there. Another team I would look out for too is the Colts. Uh, I think, I personally think they're better than the Titans, even though they, they split the season series and both teams blew out each other in the opposite game. So uh, I think the Colts though, and just if, if they can get back to, you know, what they want to do running the ball with, with three different guys, basically running the ball and a strong defense. The, the one wild card there is obviously Phil Rivers. And <laughs> if he even has enough left in the tank, but I really do like that Colts team. They blew out uh, the Raiders yesterday, who are, in my opinion, a contender, a pretender, excuse me, not a contender. But uh, I think it was an impressive win nonetheless, and I would keep my eye out on the Colts as well. Bailey, who do you like in the NFC? I think we all three of us would agree. It's probably a little bit more wide open in the NFC. Uh, I think, you know, the Packers right now are in position for that one seed. I think the Saints are an interesting wild card if they get Drew Brees back because they've been able to pretty much win with Taysom Hill at quarterback. If, the, if you get Drew Brees back, I mean, I think we'd all agree that's a pretty solid upgrade right there. But who are teams you like in the NFC to potentially make a run at the Super Bowl? Uh, I, I don't want to discount the Buccaneers at all. I mean, I think that obviously the pieces are there. I don't think that Tom Brady is, you know, really what he used to be. And that's not a hot take at all. It's just a fact. Uh, but I've been watching a lot of Packers football, man. I, I, do, I do enjoy watching them. I think that they'll, they'll, be, they'll be pretty tough to beat. Because Aaron Rodgers is really, I mean, he's having one of his best years. And it's pretty fun to see because, I mean, they just drafted a quarterback to replace him in the first round instead of giving him a wide receiver. I mean, just think about how good this team would be if they gave him real options every single year. Because they got Devontae Adams, who's who's great. Uh, Aaron Jones, who, who's pretty good um, at, at the running back position. Uh, I think that Green Bay is going to be tough to beat. I don't really want to believe in the Saints. I know they're probably well coached, um, but if Drew Brees does come back, which, you know, he's an all timer, but like for what, what are you doing this for? I guess, I mean, he has all of these ribs broken. I mean, I, I just don't want it to see him die out there. Uh, but, but the Saints, the Saints are obviously a very well coached team. Um, I don't think Taysom Hill is the future. I think he's just kind of a gadget guy. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I do like how the Packers are playing right now. And, um, it's going to be tough to beat them. It really is. Corey, any teams you like in the NFC? And I guess we've done this a few times so about who our Super Bowl prediction is, but based on what you've seen the last few weeks, who do you think right now would meet in the Super Bowl come the first Sunday of February? Well, I'll, I'll say another team to look out for. And I guess this can also connect to one of my NFL hot takes, and that would be that Jared Goff is not a good quarterback at all. <laughs> And he is purely there as a part of Sean McVay's system that elevates his game. Um, I think if the Rams, you know, if I had to trust anyone other than Goff as their quarterback, I would love the Rams, but I just don't trust Goff. I mean, I think their defense is top five in the NFL right now. I love Sean McVay as a coach and what he does there. But but like I said with Goff, I, I don't trust that guy at all. He seems to have just a game every now and then where he just absolutely implodes. And I could certainly see that happening in the playoffs. But I think you look at, the Rams, other than golf, they have one of the most complete teams, I believe, in the NFL right now. And they're, they're certainly looking like a little bit like the team that made the Super Bowl run a few a couple of years ago, two years ago, um, to their team to watch out for, in my opinion. Um, but, I, I mean, if we're going to go give, an, give a prediction right now, I'll stick to the prediction I made, I guess it was two weeks ago when we had Jake on. I, I said Packers and Chiefs. I'll stick with that. Um, my preseason prediction was – Ravens and Seahawks and that has gone a little bit by the wayside I, I think the Seahawks are still an interesting team but the rust has kind of cooled off a little bit uh, not cooking as much lately and I think their defense is is just too beaten up and and not you know the type of defense that's going to get it done uh, in 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 December or in you know going forward now into into January and February potentially I don't think they're a defense that'll get it done so I, I will stick with that prediction I made two weeks ago of of the Chiefs, I think you'd be hard pressed to choose anyone other than the Chiefs right now. So I'll stick with them winning it all against the Packers. 
Bailey, my preseason Super Bowl prediction was uh, Ravens and Saints, and obviously both of those teams are uh, – Ravens might not even make the playoffs. I think they're pretty much eliminated if they don't win tonight. So, uh, obviously, that was a great pick in the preseason. But I picked two weeks ago Chiefs and Packers. I will also stick with that prediction. I'm really curious to see what you would say. Are you going to be a homer and pick the Steelers, or do you think you'll pick the Chiefs or another team in the AFC, and who would you have them facing uh, in the NFC? Uh, you know, obviously I want the Steelers to win the Super Bowl. Uh, I just don't see it happening after these past couple of uh, games. And it pains me to say that. I, I just don't think that the Chiefs – I mean, maybe the, the, the Bills might give them the best run for their money, obviously, if they, if they meet up. Uh, but, you, you know, um, but the NFC, it's a little bit more fun to watch. I think that the Packers are, you know, pretty strong right now. And I know that the Seahawks – and I'm glad Corey brought up the Seahawks – uh, they've had a rough month and they got to get some confidence back yesterday against the Jets as, as most teams do. Uh, I think that they're, they're a really great team and they always get hot. It seems like in December and have a good little run at it, which I, the Packers beat them pretty handily in the playoffs last year, uh, which I, I found to be pretty uncharacteristic for Russell Wilson. But look, I, I think that you still, you can't forget about Seattle. I think that they're better than the Rams. Um, I got to see the head-to-head matchups on that. But uh, if I have a Super Bowl prediction, it's got to be Chiefs. I guess I'll go Chiefs-Packers, but I don't feel like good about it, to be honest. What well, about the NFC choice? About the AFC choice, yeah, I think the Chiefs have it wrapped up. But, yeah, it, we'll see. Do you think the Steelers will at least make it to the AFC Championship game? Or are you willing to go that far? Or? Well, well, I don't know, man, because they don't have the uh, – they, they have the weird – there's only one team that gets a bye now. Yep, that's right. So, I – the way the Steelers are playing right now, it looks like they want to be a one and done. And I mean, uh, the Browns are nine and three and the Steelers are 11 and two. So I I'm rooting for the Ravens tonight, which it feels disgusting to say that, but I'm rooting for the Ravens tonight. So the Steelers can get some, get some space in the AFC North race. Uh, but I don't know. I would love for them to win a playoff game. Obviously I would love that. Uh, but the AFC championship game, I mean, it's going to be tough to go into Arrowhead because it's looking like, unless the Chiefs kind of implode these next couple of weeks and then the Steelers went out, that the Steelers will have an AFC championship uh, possibility at Heinz Field. For sure. Well, great conversation on the NFL, guys. Uh, Bailey, to close out the podcast, I do want to do a rapid fire with you. It's not literally awesome. rapid fire, but uh, I'm interested to hear. I've got a few questions what would, right now. What would you. literally be rapid fire, Billy? <laughs> what would literally be other than figuratively? Okay. Sorry. Yes, sir. You're, you got a good point with that, but – uh. Let's go going right here. So actually, you kind of alluded to this with what you just said. So my first question to you was going to be, would you rather the Browns win tonight and knock out the Ravens pretty much from the playoff picture? Or would you rather the Ravens win? And that gives the Steelers a little more, a little bit more breathing room in terms of winning the AFC North. Ravens. Let's go Ravens. Oh, okay. All right. How about that? All right. How about Ben Roethlisberger's career or Eli Manning's career? I mean, I know you're a Steelers fan, but I think there are people out there that would say that both of those guys have a pretty similar career, two Super Bowl rings. Who would you take and why? Uh, Not even being a homer here. I think I'm going Ben Roethlisberger Um, because Ben has had some years where he's put up pretty crazy numbers. And I don't think Eli's really had that. I mean, you look at where the Giants have played throughout his career or I I mean, they, when they won the Super Bowl, both times they were nine and seven, right. Or something crazy like that where they were, you know, they weren't that great. And they got hot at the right time, which kudos to them. Uh, but in between those Super Bowl years, they played horrifically bad football. The Steelers, although they've been frustrating, they have never been, they haven't had a losing season since 2003. And Ben Roethlisberger was still at Miami of Ohio when that happened. So give me Ben. Say they got the same amount of Super Bowls. One more Super Bowl appearance for Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, yeah, I'm going with Ben on that one. Who's on your Mount Rushmore of Steelers? Okay, uh, so I'm going to go with Mean Joe, uh, probably Jack Lambert, um, Franco Harris. So you got to put all 70s guys. Uh, <laughs> that's tough. Um, and then I can't leave a quarterback off. Uh, they got to go Ben over Terry Bradshaw. I know Terry won four, but – no, but then, okay, replace Jack Lambert with Troy Polamalu. I was going to say no Polamalu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, replace Jack Lambert with Troy Polamalu. Because, I mean, you look at, like, the linebacking position, Jack Lambert could be argued as one of the best, too. But all these guys were play, played 30 years before I was born, too. So, I mean, I got to see 
Palomalu and Roethlisberger play a bunch of times. But, yeah, I'm going to go Palomalu on that too. So you think Ben Roethlisberger is a better quarterback than Terry Bradshaw, even though Bradshaw's got four rings? Yeah, I mean, you look at, like, how many picks Bradshaw threw. And, I mean, it's obviously apples to oranges, like just playing different styles of football. I, I mean, you look at the NFL stats now of top passing yards leaders of – of history and a lot of them are still playing just because like they can't Terry Bradshaw guys like Joe Namath and all these other quarterbacks from back then can't aren't the same athletes and aren't weren't uh, tasked to do the same things as today's offense. So yeah, I'm going to go with Ben Roethlisberger all the way. Who's the greatest quarterback of all time? Brady. Yeah. Six Super Bowls and still looking like he belongs out there. Now he's not great right now. Uh, but yeah, it's Brady. And I, I, that doesn't mean I love him, but <laughs> you look at this, just how much, how long he's been able to produce and how much he's been able to win um, with mind you, what I find was, is so fascinating about him. The one year you actually give him an, uh, an amazing receiver, they go undefeated. They had Randy Moss and they didn't, they, now granted they lost the Super Bowl, but I mean, he was winning Super Bowls with Dion Branch and Troy Brown, and he's made careers out of Wes Welker and Julian Edelman. Now, Rob Gronkowski deserves, I mean, he's probably, if not the best tight end of all time, the second best tight end of all time. So you give that guy uh, some legitimate weapons, and he's pretty much unstoppable, or he used to be. So Brady. Oh, well, I'll give you credit for saying that because obviously uh, Brady's six Super Bowl runs, you can say, fair to say that some of them have come at the expense of the uh, Steelers. But uh, oh, yeah, um, totally. favorite Virginia Tech football memory? Uh, wow, okay. I guess it'll have to be, I don't know, something during my time there, I really, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I really enjoyed going to the Belk Bowl with my friends and us coming back and my car got vandalized in the parking lot. Um, I got back to the car and uh, there's, a, I can't believe I'm saying this is my best memory. It was just like a memorable day. Uh, I got back and there's a, there's a sticky note on my, the window of my car. And it's like, don't worry. We saw the people that did this and called the police. I was like, what? I thought that somebody had backed into the car and you know, it had a dent in it or something. And I'm looking around, I'm like, I don't see any dents. And then in the back windshield, Someone had just spray painted the P word and I drove all the way home <laughs> from Charlotte with that. And I, and we went and me and two of my friends were in the car. I mean, we went to the cookout line and like there's people in the line, like taking pictures and I mean, laughing at me. Uh, but then we got it, we got it all etched out the next day. So that was actually fun. I, and another one I actually thought was pretty fun as, as far as the game. Uh, I think it was that Michael Brewer year against, UVA must have been my sophomore year where Bucky Hodges um, recovered a punt in the end zone. I mean, UVA wasn't good, neither were we, but we needed a play to get into a bowl. And then we won the military bowl after that. Uh, so I guess it was the last time Frank beat UVA at Lane Stadium was really fun too. And my final question for you is what is the worst game you've seen as a Hoagie fan, whether it's the actual, like whether it was a blowout or whether it was like a gut wrenching, like they choked it away last second type of loss. Uh, you know, I guess I haven't really been in person where it was gut wrenching. Um, uh, yes, I have. Uh, I guess I gotta say the, the Duke game comes as an obvious answer. Uh, I was pretty upset about the Belk Bowl last year. I was kind of felt stupid about that because I feel like I'm getting a little old, but I felt like they had so many chances to seal a deal and they didn't. Um, but you alluded to it earlier. I also didn't like it was that game where like nobody went to it was Pittsburgh my junior year. And there was only like a hundred yards of offense. And like, I think we've had basketball games with more people there. Uh, yeah, probably that one, but that gut wrenching Virginia tech football. I'm honestly thought the last couple of years, like the most gut wrenching Virginia tech memory ever was the Ahmed Hill Duke game. I mean, I thought that was, we had a shot to go to the final four that year and looking back, I mean, what a fun season. But it, just for it to end like that, you, you know it was going to end like that for us just because of how much we suffer most of the time. Well, for sure. And as I said last week, that, that was that's also among my favorite Hokie memories. But the only solace I have in that is, again, the tip-in was for the tie. So, you know, it, there's no guarantee we would have won. And, again, as I always like to say, Kerry Blackshear would have fouled out in the first 30 seconds. So uh, 
you know, I think uh, we probably lost yeah. a better team. It's safe to say with Zion Williamson and, and those guys, but uh, Corey, anything you want to respond to? I mean, Corey, I mean, Bailey covered a lot of ground there with the Steelers and the Hokies. Anything you want to respond to add to? Uh, I was just thinking like when he was answering some of those, my, my fifth probably Virginia tech favorite memory for football is um, probably the 2010 ACC championship. That was one of the, the first games in memory that I remember going to and they crushed Florida state that day. Tyrod Taylor was fantastic and really looked like, you know, the ACC player of the year that he was that year. So I think that's, that's a game that always sticks out to me is, you know, kind of the, the glory days of the Tyrod Taylor area. And that's really when I first kind of started following the Hokies really. That's when my brother was, was in school there as well. Um, so I think that that kind of stood out for me for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, Bailey made some some great points there of just because uh, I was thinking too, like as a Cowboy fan, who would be my? I was going to ask you that. Do you have a Mount Rushmore? Yeah, my Mount Rush for 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 Cowboys. But I, I mean, I'm thinking about it, it's like I probably have to say a bunch of old guys that I never saw play either. You know, you'd have to throw Emmett Smith on there. You'd probably have to throw Troy Aikman on there. Um, I don't know. There's just a bunch of guys that that you could include on the list. But like, if I were to include, you know, people that that I watched and, and grew up watching Romo would be number one he's always been my guy um that I loved watching as the Cowboys he's you know part of the reason I'm a Cowboys fan still today and stuff like that I, I'd put him on there I'd put I don't even know if they have enough people on there <laughs> over the past couple of years <laughs> been, you know re worthy enough of of being considered a, a Mount Rushmore so maybe this is a a mute exercise that I'm just not even really even want to get into but I mean I think you know, talk about teams that have unrealistic expectations every year as Cowboys fans should be number one on there as well. And Bailey, I'll, I'll give you the final word here because Corey's made this point. He's been really passionate about it. Dak Prescott is better than Carson Wentz. Obviously this year Wentz has been banged up and Jalen Hurts has pretty much come in. Do you agree with him that uh, Dak is better than Wentz, especially if you look at the way the Cowboys have imploded? I mean, Dak Prescott does a lot to really hold up that team. Yeah, I – I think that Dak is probably better than Carson Wentz. Yeah. I don't know if that's that hot of a take either. Cause I mean, Carson had that one year where he got hurt and uh, I mean, they went to the Super Bowl without him. So I, you know, I, and it, to Carson Wentz's credit, he was going to be, a, he was probably going to be an MVP that year. Um, but yeah, man, I, I got to go with Dak. He puts up some pretty crazy numbers for how bad the Cowboys were in those first couple of games. Um, they rely on him a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I'm going to go ahead and say that. Bailey, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast. I can't believe it's your first time, but I hope that at some point we'll have you back on in 2021. But thanks again for joining us. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. I had fun and uh, enjoy the rest of your holiday season. For sure. And Corey, we'll see what happens, but a lot of exciting stuff to come on uh, with Virginia Tech football, but also with the NFL and college football. The playoff will be coming January 1st. So very exciting time as a sports fan, even with everything going on with the pandemic and COVID. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really winding down here. And even college basketball kind of getting to the swing of things pretty soon. Conference play starting up. So really a lot to look forward to uh, kind of going forward as a sports fan. And the NBA, too, starting December 22nd. Yeah, we'll have, yeah. as always, that Christmas Day uh, basketball NBA tradition. But once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on the latest edition of Real Talk with Billy and Corey for our special guest, the voice of the Bluefield College Rams, Bailey Angle, and my podcast partner, Uncle Cornelius Michael Van Dyke. I'm Hot Take Billy Parr of Sam on hand. We say so long for just a while. Hope you have a great week. Love you, 2000.